Dear participants, dear colleagues, finally, you are all here and you all made it to liberty, legacy, and leadership. The Quadrennial Conference of IAC, the, Associ the Association of Chaplains in Higher Education. My name is Gunther Sturms, and on behalf of the Board of IAC and our co-host, the CUC, the Conference of European University Chaplains, it is a joy to welcome you here. This week, we share a sanctuary here at Sheffield University to themes that are close in our hearts. How can we offer our universities, its staff and its students, tools and method methods for sense and meaning making? How can we equip our colleges and our students with a journey? How can we as chaplains, faith advisors, or whatever word you would like to use, how can we be agents for liberation? How can we build inclusive and diverse communities? How can we build peace? And how can we inspire the next generation of leaders? And we all travel from around the globe to be here, from different continents, to address these topics. And after the Australian conference in Bendigo in 2016, we are here for our next gathering. We did have to wait another two years, but here we are determined to build bridges and network around the globe. 200 colleagues from multiple backgrounds, nationalities, religions, non-religions are here to indulge in a plethora of events, like keynote speakers, keynote events, dozens of workshops offered by you. We have visits to faith communities. You, the colleagues, all the participants are creating this experience. And please do look in the beautiful handbook with all the options. And today we already finished a pre-conference for those who arrived early. We had six rounds of workshops. So in total already 30 workshops were on offer. And we launched a journal of higher education chaplaincy online. And with so many activi activities on offer, I do hope you find the time to reflect and contemplate on your own. Attend a reflection, go for a walk, or go to the pool. While we are busy academics and practitioners, we are rooted in contemplation and meaning seeking. I wish you all a fantastic conference and a great week here in Sheffield. If you have any questions, do please ask the IA board. Please stand up or our co-host from the CEUC, please stand up, if possible, of course. <laughs> and there are other people with yellow tags who are here from Sheffield to help us as well. Thank you so much. And I really have all the gratitude what you have done all these years to prepare for us. Here is my colleague, Jay. <laughs> to introduce our first keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Gorda. One of the things that um, COVID has taught us is that there are so many different ways that we can be present and that we can present and that we can share our knowledge and our experience and our passions. And so for our very first keynote address tonight, Grace is joining us all the way from Exeter. 
There's Grace here. Everybody wave at Grace because she will see you all wave. <laughs> I'm here too. <laughs> Grace will be speaking tonight on changing religion, changing universities, changing chaplaincy. Hopefully you've had a chance to read Grace's bio, but I'll just read a little bit of it for you. So Grace Davy is an emer em emeritus professor in the sociology. Oh, my mouth is not working. It's not it's not it is. Anyway, that's what she does, the religion in the University of Exeter. And she has been engaged with the sociology of religion since the mid-1980s. She's particularly interested in patterns of religion in Europe and in new theoretical paradigms that are emerging in the field, including the idea of multiple modernities. Grace has written much. I believe she's got a brand new book out that she's very excited about. That's what I was told anyway. But um, let us listen and share um, in what Grace will tell us. Grace, over to you. Thank you so much for your welcome. Can I just make sure you can all hear me? That's good. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be doing this opening address. I'm sorry that I'm not with you in, in, in person. There were reasons, the family reasons, that that was going to be difficult this week. But I want to, to set the scene for your wonderful week. I've looked at the handbook and I'm so excited about what you have in front of you. And I'm just going to try and, and frame this a little bit so we have some sort of context to work in. I'm really aware. Um, I know what I must say to you. Um, I believe it's possible for these slides to be available to you uh, after this session, or at least after the conference. So no need to write them all down. They, they, they'll, they'll arrive somehow. Uh, 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 and so, you know, just use them as a guide and, and listen to, to how I, I work around them. Sorry, now we've got the first slide up and we're going to go to the next one right now. Um, move one, please, if that's okay. I think somebody's doing that for me. Here we go. Um, this conference is a much awaited moment. It's been in my email for more than two years, so it must have been in yours too. And as we finally arrive in Sheffield, uh, it's a very critical time in the modern world. We're emerging from a global pandemic and the war between Russia and Ukraine continues to dominate the news and trouble us. The strains and stresses can be felt in every part of society, not least in the institutions of higher education. I want to work through the implications of this situation in three stages. First, looking at changing religion in the modern world then at changing universities, and then honing in on changing chaplaincy. So, okay, we go to the next slide. Uh, changing religion. Now, a wonderful source of data for you, you many of you may know this already, is um, the material, the, the data sets you can find on the Pew Foundation website, which is a wonderful, free resource to all of us interested in global patterns of religion. Now, don't go there if you are in a hurry because you'll find yourself taken from one thing to the next and, and you'll be fascinated by what you find. And I'm just going to hone in on two or three studies so that you just get the idea of what might be available to you. They underline the following statement. For more than 80% of the world's population, in 2021, 2022, religion is a lived, situated and constantly changing reality and has as much to do with navigating everyday life as it does with the supernatural. Now you'll get these links with the, uh, with the uh, slides and you'll see I've, I've put in bold the dates of the study or the studies. 2012 was a wonderful um, overview of the global religious landscape. Five years later in 2017, there was a very interesting um, piece of work on, on how these patterns of religion are changing. And they were not indicating increased secularity. They were 
indicating an adjustment uh, between the major groups, the major world faiths, that Christianity would recede a little bit and Islam would be likely to grow towards the middle of the 21st century. Interestingly here, that the, a lot rests on the argument that secular people, secular cohorts, have fewer children than religious ones. So although the secular is an attraction for many people, it doesn't reproduce itself in terms of demographics, which is something worth thinking about. And it is in tension with the 2018 study, which does tell us that younger people are less religious than older people. So you've got a, a tension to consider at that point. And to be honest, I don't think we're going to know um, exactly what will happen, but it does look as though religion will be present in, the, it, 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 in a global sense for the foreseeable future. And I added their detailed study of India. I did this for two reasons. It's one of the most religious places in, in the entire globe. And in Britain, at least, it's one of the sources of immigration into our universities. Chinese and Indian students are going to be the dominant groups in our overseas student cohorts. Okay, let's go on. Next slide. That's so much for data and data sets, big digital studies, which when I started working some, um, uh, 50 years ago now, um, you, you just couldn't do that. We were still poking knitting needles into punch cards. There were no computers in the sense that we use them now. That's a real revolution in the discipline. Two books, two books that fascinate me. I like them partly because they're not kind of textbooks. They're, 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 they're called trade books. They sell on the open market. They're not particularly geared for academics. They are very well written and very interesting. This one published in 2013 is about four leaders and five countries. The four leaders are Mrs. Thatcher, Prime Minister of England in Britain, UK in 1979, Deng Xiaoping in China, John Paul II, the, the, the Pope, um, the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. And so you have your five countries which are UK, China, Poland, Iran, and adding Afghanistan. And what the author does, who is Christian Carroll, is in retrospect, and it is a retrospective look at 1979, a key date, what he calls the birth of the 21st century. He shows that in each case, the assumed actors of the 20th century, the strong state and the commitment to secularism give way to a free market and increasingly visible religion. I find it fascinating because what seem to be five discrete countries or four discrete la um, leaders, he joins the dots to show a pattern um, that the state is giving, a, giving way to an in extent, a strong state is giving way to religion and a free market. There's a shift going on. To be honest, I think there are more shifts going on since. But my point to you is nobody saw this coming. Why not? That's because the assumptions of European social science and beyond in policymaking simply did not see or anticipate the significance of religion. They were looking in the wrong direction. So they didn't see what was happening in Afghanistan as the pressure on the Soviet Union came from um, the, 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 the um, Islamic actors present at that time in Afghanistan. They did not see the significance of the Pope in Poland. And, UK and China are more about the market than religion, but, but they're part of the same shift. 
something was happening and we were looking in the wrong direction. Okay, could you go to the next slide? Now I'm putting the dates in a row. I've got 1979, 1989, and 9-11 in 2001. And the book this time is called God is Back, How the Global Rise of Faith is Changing the World. It's quite a widely read book, widely reviewed. Um, John Micklethwaite was the um, editor-in-chief of The Economist and Adrian Waldridge was the, had, um, uh, the chief at the American desk. Um, so they are highly qualified secular journalists. And I much respect their work and it's extremely sympathetic to religion and nicely written, but its title in my view is misleading. It's a very interesting account, but it gives the impression that religion wasn't there and it suddenly came back, God is back, a nice catchy title, but not quite true. I would argue that religion did not disappear and is not disappearing, nor is it resurgent with the strong implication of toxic. Religion rather is persistent. And what happened around the turn of the century, particularly after 9-11, was a change in perception rather than a change in reality. It was a wake up call to the West to say, you've got this wrong. You're looking in the wrong direction. We need to engage the religious factor if we are going to understand what is happening in the modern world. And that is equally the case now. I'm not going to develop um, what is happening in, in Ukraine and Russia in any detail. I haven't got time, but I think what is interesting is to um, simply to say to you that if you don't understand the religious dimension of that um, conflict, you will not really understand what is happening. I'll develop it a little bit in, in due course, but not in detail. I'm sure it will be present in your um, engagement, in, in your workshops and that kind of thing. Let's just put Europe into this global context. And this is the question I want you to think about. I think about it considerably. Is Europe secular because it is modern? Or is Europe sec secular because it is European? Is it exceptional to the patterns of the wider world? We used to think that what Europe did everybody else would do tomorrow. That is incorrect. And it's very misleading in terms of our analyses of religion. How do we define Europe? That's a, a complex question. East Europe is very different from the West. And as I've already said to you, the Russian Orthodox Church, the religious factor is a critical factor in understanding that war and Putin's aspirations um, for a Russian world. They're deeply embedded in his understanding of orthodoxy. Now you may not like that, none of us feel at ease with it, but you cannot ignore it. And if you do, you are misleading or, or, or misreading the situation and it will be more difficult to find a solution. West Europe is rather special, the bit of Europe you're currently in. I know you come from all over the world, which is, is so good to, to, to appreciate. But West Europe, where you are now, you see two things happening at once, which is going to be central as we move forward in my analysis. West Europe is becoming both increasingly secular and increasingly diverse, religiously diverse. And what is happening in that situation that all too often Christia Christianity, almost Christianism, is um, shifting from religion to culture, heritage, and it's becoming in, in some people's perception, a bulwark against outsiders, very often Islam. What till quite recently was a cherished inheritance can now be, but deployed by 
populist forms of politics and religion as a bulwark against outsiders. It's not an easy situation. Now let's move to the analysis of universities in this context. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Now you don't need to work very hard to discover good, consistent and repeating statistics about the continuing growth in higher education, which is a global phenomenon, a very positive phenomenon and often argued to be a secularizing process. Education brings with it greater levels of secularity. Yes? Or not? Let's think. I want to concentrate here on the UK case. Forgive me for doing that because I can't talk about every case and I'm going to talk about the case I know best and I'm going to talk, give you examples from the case I know best. I hope I'm going to develop them in a way that you could take the analysis, take the framework and then develop or think about your own universities in your own countries in similar ways. Now, in the, UK, in the UK, there has most certainly been huge expansion in higher education since the 1960s, the decade when it really took off. Transformation from an elite to a mass system. Uh, and I, I, I say this from the heart, this is my own experience. I went to the university as an undergraduate in the 1960s. About 11% of the population attended higher education at that time, um, amongst which only two or three percent were women. So I was pretty lucky. I did go and I got an enormous amount out of it. As I left my teaching post about 10 years ago, it could not be more different. Huge rise in the percentage of people in higher education pretty much equal men and women, though not equal in every discipline, and um, an enormous rise in international students. Um, in 2021, again, these stats are quite easy to, to, to verify, um, international students made up over 20% of the UK student population, a fifth. Um, around 15% of all undergraduates and around 37% of all postgraduates. So it's skewed a little bit to postgraduate work. Um, the total number of overseas students has grown by 30% in the last nine years in the UK. Now, again, you could find those statistics and look at the patterns of the places where you are working. Um, there is a kind of league table. Um, the US has the most overseas students, followed by the UK, um, and that I'm pretty sure is the attraction of English speaking. The next um, on the list is China. And you can also find league tables of um, where the students come from. And in the UK, the students come disproportionately from China and from India which is partly why I pointed out to you the, 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 the work on India right at the beginning of my presentation. How do we um, work with this? What are the implications for student life? What we have and what I have experienced as I've taught over several decades is the student body is changing very rapidly. In this, we have the factors that I pointed out to you of modern Europe, which is growing secularity and growing religious diversity. They're both happening at once. So we could put this differently, um, which I think is, is, is a really perhaps the most important thing I want to say to you um, this evening. The student body as a whole, I think, and 
one of my case studies shows this very, very clearly. You'll see that in just a moment. The student body as a whole is likely to be more attuned to faith and diversity than those who teach or manage or look after them. The change is being driven by the increasing internationalism of student life. And this will vary a little bit from um, institution to institution, depending on the weighting of overseas students. But there's a huge carrot, of course, for all universities to recruit from outside UK, is that these people bring us money. And so a great deal of student um, uh, university policy is geared to being attractive to overseas students which is why we need to think back to the framing of religion across the world that I started with, appreciating that the relative secularity, not total, relative secularity of Europe is the exceptional case, the unusual case. And what is operating very powerfully in university life, you know this, all of you, is the diversity agenda which has many dimensions. It's not only about religion, it's about all sorts of things. And even now, I'm 10 years into retirement, I still keep my Exeter email address. And in order to retain it, about every three years, I have to do a training model on diversity in which all these things are brought before me and updated regularly. You know, all of you, those in policy making or those who, who, who are looking after students in any capacity, you must pay attention to diversity. There are adjustments to teaching, some of which I think are healthier than others. Um, adjustments to the timetable. In some universities, you would pay considerable attention to timetabling exams on Saturdays if you had significant numbers of Jewish students? And how would you manage that? Um, that is in, in relation to exams too. Um, you know, how do you manage that particular bit of, of, of teaching and testing? The curriculum itself is carefully scrutinized. Um, Sometimes I think this is, is correct and healthy. Other times I think it is deeply worrying. Should we adjust our curriculum in order not to offend? I, I, I think that is quite difficult to answer. And maybe that can be a discussion point during, your, during the week. And in a moment, I'm just going to look in, uh, uh, at one aspect of delivery. It, it, on my next slide, but just before I go there, um, we know too that there have been considerable adjustments to welfare provision because of the diversity agenda. COVID was a, um, a sort of game changer. How on earth were we going to manage this and look after people in these entirely different circumstances that nobody had anticipated? And how much chaplaincy was called upon to to support the, the, the welfare sections of the university, which were seriously under strain and all the mental health issues and how they should be managed for people who are very different and had very different expectations. Um, and who, how was it appropriate to look after them? But even more um, significant, I think, um, or, or, or in parallel, you see a very um, marked change in marketing, how you sell your university. And here I think the attention to religion is increasing all the time. Um, in my own university, there is concern about the facilities for Muslims. Are the Muslim prayer, uh, prayer rooms adequate? Will they attract the kind of population we want or will they go to another university which does this better? And suddenly there's a kind of wake up call to we need to cater carefully for incoming students from all over the world, not forgetting 
British students of well, uh, uh, as well, who have perhaps different aspirations and different priorities. Um, managing these things is not easy. And let's just look at the um, curriculum delivery in um, just a little bit more detail. I find this very fascinating because there has been so much discussion um, in univ the university world on decolonializing the curriculum and indeed the research agenda for those who are um, employed in that capacity in university. And as far as I can see, surely, surely this must pay include paying greater attention to religion. Put differently, we must cease to assume that moderately secular Europe, the West, is the leading global region. And that what Europe does today, everyone else will do tomorrow. I've already said that. I'm afraid it's becoming a refrain. You might hear it one more time. Here I use in my own work, and I do recommend it, um, Shmuel Eisenstadt, he, he, he died not so very long ago, a very, very distinguished Jewish scholar who de developed the idea of multiple modernities, which sets out very clearly that um, different global regions, different global cultures become modern in different ways. And, and what he's really trying to, to make us understand and help us to think about is that modernization does not imply secularization. In our part of the world, we've made the assumption that the two go together. But if you think globally, that is not the case. And I'm just interested in how that is going to feed into the notion of decolonializing the curriculum, which is, um, quite a buzz phrase at the moment. That would be an interesting thing to develop in, in, in some of your groups. But to, to kind of pull this together, uh, uh, and so I leave it in uh, as, uh, as I get my points across as, uh, and illustrate them as well as I can, I want to look at two UK case studies of chaplaincy in this changing context. Uh, my reasons for choosing these are um, because they're the two institutions I know firsthand. Now, the first is the London School of Economics, um, where I did my um, PhD uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, so um, a long time ago. Uh, some of you may know the school, and I know that um, representatives of the Faith Centre, Jim Walters and a colleague, are coming on Thursday to the conference uh, and we'll tell you more about the work they're doing, uh, which to be quite honest, astonishes me. And I tell you why. The LSE, that, that's the shortening for the London School of Economics, was founded in 1900. And I really would have put money on this being one of the most secular institutions in London. It was a founded for the teaching and research in the social sciences, creating a series of disciplines underpinned by a secular philosophy of science, which developed out of the European, in particular, the French enlightenment. I did sociology there, but it has po political science, economics, um, all the social sciences, including history. Um, I, I, and. It, it is self or has been self-consciously secular. This is where you, for example, in, in the field that partly I was close to, the field that I was in was um, quite close to social work, social policy. I, I moved into academic sociology rather than that. And there was a conscious um, feeling in the 1960s. How do we replace church-based, religious-based philanthropy with secular, social policy. What is the philosophy of science that will underpin this? This is what the school was about. This is what it existed to do. Now, fast forward 60 plus years, and in the school, you have a hugely, hugely international student body. I mean, even more so than the most British universities many of whom bring their respective religions with them to the school. And you can look in detail at the Faith Centre. 
which is the new home for LSE's diverse religious activities, its interfaith program, and it creates a reflective space for all staff and students. I've given you the link, you, you can find all that online. And when they come on Thursday, you can ask them all sorts of questions. Um, and I am privileged to sit on the management board of, 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 of this center. And to be honest, I, I am gobsmacked at what has happened. I really am. How this has happened at the school. So let's go to the next slide. This is a university that gathers people from every corner of the world and every imaginable faith tradition. In this, the LSE Faith Center models an accommodation of robust religious pluralism within staff and student bodies, as well as setting a strong agenda for developing the religious literacy and interfaith understanding that so urgent, is so urgently needed in the wider world. And if you look carefully at it, um, it starts with pastoral care, which I suppose is central to all chaplaincy. It, it majors a lot on interfaith dialogue and developing religious literacy. How do this, this enormously diverse body speak to each other? And it models this. And that I think is a challenge to all chaplaincies. Can this be done? robustly and, and um, being generous and welcoming to everybody, but speaking in the right language. Now the LSE goes a wee bit further in that it uh, is, is consciously trying to train leaders in this field, in the field of religious literacy and interfaith dialogue. I think that is an aspiration for chaplaincy. It may not be immediately possible, and in order to do this, it's, it's increasingly underpinned by an interdisciplinary research program, which I think, I don't know of any other chaplaincy which does this. Um, you can uh, look at it, if you look at the religion and global society element um, at, on the website, and you can see the kind of things they're doing and the kind of um, people that they're groups in the school that they are working with. And I, I, I'll, I'll just say a word about that before I go on to my second case study, but do take a look at that website um, and just remember how that has changed since the 1960s. And um, it has changed because of the international nature of the student body. Uh, just to make life more complicated, sorry, um, sociology at the school goes in the opposite direction. I was there in the 1960s and one reason I was there is because the teaching of religion was dominant in the department of sociology. David Martin, my mentor, I met there. Eileen Barker, you might not know her, a lot of work on new religious movements. John Peel was a very distinguished anthropologist of religion working on the Yoruba in Nigeria. Susan Budd, um, a different kind of approach. Um, David Martin, who, to whom I owe a huge amount, um, used to describe himself as an academic deviant living by a non-existent subject. That's how he felt in the school. He felt that, you know, he, 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 was doing, he wasn't doing the right things to be at the um, London School of Economics. He also taught me that when you're perceiving religion um, and, and if you're trying to um, bring religion to the attention of other people, um, very often, if the outcome of religion is a good one, people argue that religion is really something else. It, it can't be really religion. It, it's something else that's going on that has ended in uh, something beneficial. But if the outcomes are less good, it's definitely religion. And that kind of negative spin, you do still encounter quite a bit. Currently, the Faith Center partners with not sociology, but anthropology, women, P 
peace and security in, in a very interesting study concentrating on gender and inevitably with the Middle East Center, how can you understand the Middle East without paying attention to religion? And okay to go to the next slide and, and my next case study, which is where I have, uh, I, I've been part of Exeter University, University of Exeter twice, uh, once as an undergraduate, and then I came back um, so quite, an, quite a bit later um, to teach in the Department of Sociology in, in Exeter. And here you have a very different post-war institution. Exeter is a secular university, but the Anglican Church of England dominant tradition um, influence is very apparent. Uh, including a chapel that was gifted to the institution, personal gift in memory of someone. Uh, it was consecrated in 1958, so it's just over 60 years old. It's now a listed building, I'll show you a picture in a minute, um, which has a noted acoustic. And part of that lends itself to a developing musical tradition which is a um, forms of liturgy, which incorporate music and a formal choir work well in the chapel. That's the way you start in Exeter. You start with not assuming secularity or secularism or a secular ideology like you do in the LSE. You start with an unofficial, at least, assumption of dominant Anglicanism, dominant church dominant religious tradition of the country of which you are part. Not aggressive, but certainly a kind of um, presence which is assumed. Uh, now, currently in Exeter, and I say currently, it's very, very recent. Chaplaincy is changing. It consists of a multi-faith team of faith leaders from a wide variety of backgrounds. These include Baha'i, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, humanism, and Islam. And we also have funded by the university, which is unique. I mean, it's, it's only just happened in Exeter because the Anglican tradition was funded by an Anglican foundation. Now we have a part-time multi-faith coordinator Ramona, who is in Sheffield with you. She might be able to wave, I don't know whether she can, but uh, you must find Ramona and get her to tell you the detail of this. She has just got an administrator to work with her. This is funded by the university and very shortly, well, two years or so, there will be a purpose-built chaplaincy center. Now in the 2010s, for the first time in its history, since it got its charter immediately after the Second War, the university has put significant sums of money into multi-faith chaplaincy. Why did they do it? Well, for all the reasons that I explained to you, this is part of a modern university. This needs to be there if you want the student body that you're trying to attract. Um, this is a new set of initiatives. And I'm wondering whether you're going to, to share with each other similar experiences. And depending on when your university began, um, um, you will have a distinctive inheritance. Sometimes it is Anglican, sometimes it's quite interdenominational, but not to do with other faiths, because that hadn't really been imagined in the 60s and 70s. Sometimes you start later and you've got a much better inclusion of other faiths right from the start. Everybody starts in a different place, but we all need to work to this um, incorporation and, and, and inclusion and sensitivity to many different faiths. Now, I'll just show you two pictures of Exeter, which will show you the, 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 the fairly dramatic change. This is the Mary Harris Memorial Chapel outside and in. You can see that Exeter had in the um, early post-war period 
period, aspirations to Oxbridge. It looks like an Oxbridge chapel, Oxford or Cambridge. Fixed pews, very Christian. It's an attractive building. The ceiling is, is, is unusual and unnoted, but there's not a lot you can do with that in terms of multi-faith worship or presence. You can welcome everybody for sure, but, but its Christian symbolism is, is undeniable. Now go on to the next slide. And this doesn't exist. This, this, this is, a, this is a, um, a digital, whatever it is, model, I suppose. Um, this is the proposed multi-faith center. It should be there in a couple of years if we um, you, you know, cross our fingers and hope for the best. It has been signed off by the university. That's quite a step. And it's designed as a new space for quiet reflection and multi-faith activities which promote respect, community and inclusion. I'm truly delighted to see that there. And it's a huge step in quite a traditional university. Why did they do it? That's the question you need to answer. So we go to the last couple of slides. I'm just about on time, I think. Can we go to the next one? I see universities as a microcosm of society. Here we are in a society now, which is becoming both more secular and more religiously diverse. Now, what happens in that combination? Secularization erodes religious literacy. As night follows day, the more secular people get, the less able they are to talk well about religion. Doesn't mean whether you are religious or not religious, you lose the vocabulary with which to speak. But at exactly the same time, religion and religious debate is increasingly present in the public sphere, driven by increasing diversity. What emerges all too often is an ill-informed, ill-mannered debate. I find this profoundly depressing and I hear it on the radio, on television, I see it in the media, and I find it distressing and depressing. And so the challenge on the last slide, to what extent do universities reflect this situation? And to what extent do they or can they challenge it? How can we foster a more constructive conversation about religion? What is the role of chaplaincy in this task? If you go back to the faith center of the LSE, it's to look after people, to care sensitively for their various needs. It's to encourage dialogue between faiths. I would extend that to picking out and training leaders who can do that, not only in university life, but in later life. You are, as it were, building, setting the building blocks for a better public conversation about faith in your respective societies. Interdisciplinary research, I think, is a stretch for most chaplaincies. Uh, you can keep it in mind, if you like, or look and see what they're doing at the LSE, which is very interesting. You may be able to link up with relevant departments in your universities who can show you the kinds of things they're doing and the kind of ways they're working to get this better conversation about faith in our societies. And as you go out to, to your workshops and various things this week, I really wish you well as you carry these questions forward. It's been a privilege to speak to you and to start off this um, what you're wanting to do and, and to be with you for an hour this evening. I wish you well, enjoy the week uh, and take away good memories of what you've learned in Sheffield. Thank you for listening to me.
Grace, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. I can. Excellent. All right. Do you have a moment that you could perhaps take a question or two? Uh, I have that. I was told that was in the schedule. Yes. Excellent. Oh, we're on the same page. That always works. I'm wondering, Kunta has a microphone. I'm wondering if there is a question or two that we would like to ask Grace. We've got about ten minutes that we could do that. And what I would ask you to do is, as you stand and speak, your name and your university and your country would help probably help Grace a little bit, and also show off how many people are. Are there any questions for Grace? She's Florida, so we're down here, Kunta. <laughs> Hey, great. Uh, my name is Rabbi Alex Goldberg. I'm the Dean of Religious Life at the University of Surrey. Uh, I liked your presentation, not least because we've modeled a bit on Exeter, modeled a bit on LSC, ended up with the Surrey model. Uh, one of the questions for the future that we're asking ourselves about space and in a multi religious and increasingly international student uh, environment is whether we have space models which are shared spiritual space that can be adapted versus those spaces which are specific to individual communities and feel like a home from home. I know LSC and perhaps Exeter have gone one way with that, or maybe two different ways with that, uh, and other universities likewise. Uh, what's, your, what's your answer to that? Do we need, we, do we need a collective spiritual space? Uh, or do we need areas and corners uh, that make communities feel home from home? Do you want me to answer straight away or shall we collect a couple of questions, three questions and um, bring them together? Maybe we listen to a couple of questions and bring them together. That way you get to hear a little bit more. Thank you. Hi, Grace. David Hutchison, University of Aberdeen. I'm curious to know whether who funds a chaplain will, will dictate what they can and cannot do. In other words, if the university and my own situation in Scotland, the ancient universities all have university employees as chaplains, but I know across England, the majority of chaplains are either generational appointments or faith body um, volunteers. And I just wonder if the funding model has any impact on what a chaplain or chaplaincy can do, can offer. Thank you. Thank you. One, one more and then we'll go to yes. the answers. Being Grace, my name is Rick Hosworth. I'm from the Netherlands, attending uh, the University of Delft. Um, the Netherlands uh, now is for more than 50%, uh, more than 50% of the population identifies non religious. However, two thirds of the population identify as spiritual. Um, so, in your, if I may interpret it this way, advocacy of religion, um, do you see uh, space for being religious, sorry, spiritual, but not religious? And how do we accommodate that? Or is religion required, do you think, for the future? Thank you. Grace, three completely different questions there, but I'll you answer them. I'll do my best. Um, the, the question about shared or discrete space. Um, I don't think there's one answer to that. Um, a, a, an awful lot depends on where you start and what you've got. Um, be, because uh, it, it, bricks and mortar are expensive and, 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 and you can't keep on changing it as the religious body varies. Also, you need to take into account what is available in the city in which you are situated. Um, because in some cities there will be uh, one synagogue, sometimes two. Um, there may be a mosque or a variety of mosques and a number of places where you can be um, express different forms of Buddhism. 
in other you know, um, cities, that, that's going to be much more difficult. Um, my hunch is that shared space is tricky. I think it's better used for shared hospitality than for specifically religious activities. Um, but of course, um, with dietary um, uh, ideas that vary, you, you, you've got quite a, a lot to think about. I, I know Ramona told me the other day that, that the new chaplaincy space in Exeter will be vegetarian, period, uh, uh, which, which is what you're going to start with. But, but you may not be starting now, you may have started ages ago, and, and then you've got to adapt it. So work it through with your students, work it through with your staff, make sure it's a collective decision, and what you're going to go for will have to be optimal, not perfect. That is life. Um, you can't, you, you know, you can't please everybody, but you can work together to get the best possible solution for as many people as possible. Um, and then if there are people who don't feel um, able to share what you, provision you have, try to make sure that there is another way of looking after them possibly by um, recourse to, to, to people in the city or in the surrounding area city. Um, who appoints and who pays the chaplain is um, critical, um, but it, it's not easy uh, because I mean, it is perfectly true that people who pay pipers call tunes. Uh, and if you are funded by, <coughs> at least by the diocese, half by the diocese, say the Anglican diocese, they would expect you to <coughs> keep that in mind in, in, in your activities. You may not want to be, excuse me. Your agenda may pull in a different direction. <coughs> but you, again, it, it's, you've got to work with what is optimal and you've got to, to make it as flexible as you can. And I think you've got to speak with your sponsors and donors in order that they understand your situation. Um, it, to order to explain that the, 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 the challenges you face and the student body and the staff that you work with are very varied and, and, and you must pay, you must, uh, do, uh, uh, look after everybody and give everybody a, a kind of um, attention, even if you personally don't work with them in terms of um, providing worship and that kind of thing. A, a lot of what I think you have to accept is that it has to be optimal and it won't be perfect. Um, in the Netherlands, it's true here too, an awful lot of people do say they're spiritual and not religious. A lot of people seek out um, a humanist chaplain that's absolutely fine. Um, that's part of the mix. Um, and you see it sort of edging into the well being things um, and a lot of meditation and that, that kind of thing, uh, which is very developed in many universities. Um, again, it, I hope it doesn't contradict what I said, it's part of the mix. Um, I suppose I did concentrate on, on, on the kinds of religion coming in with overseas students, which I think have been a game changer. But of course, you pay attention to the spiritual uh, uh, and you try to give opportunities to those students to meet with each other, to talk to um, people who are interesting, to bring speakers in who, who, who are likely to give them um, uh, interesting information and interesting experience. Uh, and, and that can be part of chaplaincy, just like everything else. Um, you will find, inevitably, that some of these currents pull against each other. But I mean, what's new? Um, that, that has always happened in chaplaincy. And there are different bits of the Anglican church who are pretty good at pulling against each other, even without adding anybody else in at all. So it's hardly a new thing. Um, you work in teams, you, 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 can, you, you have great convening power in terms of bringing in expertise, bringing in interest, um, use it, use it uh, 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 and get 
uh, and look and see who you're working with, consult with them and take it forward in the best way that you, you, you think you can. Grace, thank you so much. Um, the, the, the thoughts, the ideas, the education and the academic rigor through that has been all you've given us has been wonderful. I know I will take lots away to think about. And I heard a number of hmms at various places <laughs> during your talk. I thank you very much for being our inaugural speaker for our conference, for the time that you've put in for this preparation. And um, please, everybody, let us thank Grace. For this. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. We are running amazingly to time, which is always a challenge, at least we are tonight. Um, so, um